Hello everyone, today I'll be talking about how to get rigid matrices from rectangular PCPs in this joint work with Amay Bangale, Prahlad Harsha, and Avishai Tal. Well first off, what are rigid matrices? Well a matrix is rigid if it's far from being low rank. Okay, so rigidity we have this rank parameter rho and this distance parameter delta, and a matrix is rigid if not only is its rank higher than rho, but also to lower its rank to rho you'd have to change at least a delta fraction of its entries. Why do we care about rigid matrices? Well, there are many reasons. I won't go over all of them right now. But uh, one really nice reason is that uh, Valiant in the 70s showed that the linear transformation induced by a rigid matrix cannot be computed by linear size logarithmic depth circuits. Well, this means that if you can construct a rigid matrix within some class, you get slower circuit lower bounds with respect to that class. Well, that's a nice formal definition, but what are rigid matrices? One way I like to think about rigid matrices is that if I have a matrix here, given by this gray rectangle, and say this matrix is low rank, well, that means that it can be decomposed into the product of a tall matrix A and a wide matrix B. So in that sense, low rank matrices are compressible. You can take n square bits and compress them into roughly n times row bits, where we think of row as you know smaller than n. And not only are they compressible, but they also have an efficient way to recover the data. So if you want to recover a particular entry in A times B, well, you know from linear algebra that all you have to do is take a dot product of a row of A and a column of B. So in this light, we can say that rigid matrices are not only, are they not compressible, but they're not even approximately compressible, okay? And this viewpoint will actually be quite helpful later on. So what are some known constructions of rigid matrices? First off, a random matrix is rigid, but that's not a very explicit construction. Well, there are many other constructions of rigid matrices. I won't be able to talk about them, but I will link to a survey. But I do want us to focus on this last construction in this table last year. So last year in this conference, Fox, uh, Josh Allman and Li Jia Chen showed a construction of rigid matrices with rank two to the log n to the quarter. Distance, constant distance, that's fantastic. I do want us to note that the running time is not polynomial, it's, you can think of this as polynomial with an oracle to NP. Okay? And our construction, uh, given these parameters, it's actually in a very similar regime. The only difference is an improvement of the rank from 2 to the log n to the quarter to 2 to the log n over log log n. So you can think of this as like nearly polynomial, n to the 1 over log log n. Okay? Here's a table that shows how the rank changes as n grows. But enough about parameters, let's talk about how to get our construction. Okay, so as the title promises, we use PCPs. So a PCP is a probabilistically checkable proof system. It consists of a verifier V that has his input a claim and wants to verify a proof for the claim. Okay, so it outputs one if they think the claim is correct and zero if, they think, if it thinks that the claim is false. The catch is that the verifier can read only very few bits of the proof, okay? Think like maybe three bits of the proof. And because of this restriction, we allow the verifier to choose its queries randomly, okay? So we'll use this notation, v pi r, to mean the decision that verifier v makes when it samples random coins r and is given access to the proof pi, okay? What do we want out of a PCP? Well, one thing is we want it to be complete which means that correct claims has a, can always be proven. Okay, so any correct claim always has some proof that convinces the verifier with very high probability. Think of C as a, very, as a number that's very close to one, or maybe even one. For soundness, any incorrect claim cannot be proven. This is another thing we want. So we want that if you give the verifier an incorrect claim, no matter what proof you give, verifier will very often reject or we'll accept a very small probability. Think of S as a constant close to zero. 
Another property that we need, and this property is like looked at less often, but it's still very useful here, is this smoothness property. Each location pi is equally likely to be red. So think of your proof pi. I wrote it here as this uh, line. And then could it be the case that the proofs, for the bits in the first part of the proof are read very often, whereas bits in the second part of the proof are read inoftenly? Here I'm plotting the probability that a certain bit is queried. Well, smoothness says, no, this cannot be the case. All bits are created equal. All bits are equally likely to be queried. And the reason this is useful for us here is because smoothness, you can easily see that it implies tolerance, okay? So if a proof is almost correct, correct, correct claim, it'll still be accepted with very high probability, okay? So, Alman and Chen, one year ago, looked at PCPs as proofs, they are proofs, and they kind of said this like meta statement, hard claims have complex proofs. So what is hard, we'll talk about in a moment, but the complex proofs here will be PCPs, and they're complex because they are rigid, okay? So we'll think of proofs as matrices, and these matrices, we argue, are rigid. Still in the Almond Chen paradigm, we need three ingredients, or rather they need three ingredients. The first ingredient is the non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem, which simply states that there is a language that can be decided in exponential time with exponential length witness, but you can't shave even a logarithmic factor off of its decision uh, time and witness complexity. And furthermore, just it's convenient that this language is unary, so the yes cases are all one strings. A second component is a very fast counting algorithm. And what does it count? It counts the number of ones in a low rank matrix without even reading the whole matrix. So how's this possible? Well, the low rank matrix is given in its tall wide decomposition, okay? So you give A and B and you can count the number of ones in the product in time that's less than N squared. Um, don't worry about the parameters here so much, but of course, as the rank is smaller, then the time is faster, so there's more savings. And the last very crucial component is uh, this like state-of-the-art kind of PCP construction. So these are PCPs that are smooth, as we said, and they're also very efficient, and they're also very short. So what do I mean by short? The witness was of exponential length, so the PCP is of nearly exponential length. Okay, another way to look at this is to see that the randomness that the PCP uses is nearly linear, okay? Only uses logarith logarithmic factor more than the original input. And as we said, we'll be looking at PCPs as matrices, which we will argue are rigid. So this good kind of picture to keep in mind is that this matrix is an N by N matrix, where N squared is the length of the PCP, roughly two to the K. Okay, so we'll keep this in the top right corner for safekeeping. And then the theorem that Alman Chen proved is that proofs for this language L in this proof system are rigid. So what do I mean by this? I mean that we have a procedure to generate rigid matrices. So the procedure, when it wants to generate an N by N matrix, it chooses K such that K is roughly log N, right? We want all of these parameters to work out. Then it computes a proof, pi, that should make the verifier accept the input one to the K. Okay? Now, one thing to observe is that this computation of a proof pi can indeed, indeed be done in polynomial time if you have access to an NP oracle. You can kind of guess the proof bit by bit and then eventually verify this guess uh, in polynomial time by going enumerating over all the randomness of the verifier. Well, why is this proof rigid? The argument is that if this proof is not rigid, then we'll be able to decide L in time that's too good to be true. So, so far, this is the Almond Chen paradigm. And this is where we diverge, okay? so. Now, soon, we will start talking about rectangular PCPs. 
So we need to decide this language L in time too good to be true, assuming that proofs are not rigid. So how do we decide L? The decision procedure works as follows. Given input one to the K, pi was not rigid, right? So we'll guess a low rank matrix that approximates pi and we'll guess its decomposition. And this is really the key point that we have to guess the decomposition because we can't even write all of pi down, nor can we write a times b down entirely because that would already be two to the k time. We need to save that k factor. So we'll write a and b separately, the decomposition. And what do we do next? I want to take us on a quick thought experiment. So we have a and b in our minds, right? This low rank matrix. And what do we do with low rank matrices? Well, all we know is that we can count the number of ones in them, right? I mentioned that earlier. But counting the number of ones in the proof or in something that's close to the proof, that's not very helpful. That's not very helpful information um, to know what is the number of ones in a proof. That does not necessarily mean anything. Instead, and I ask for some suspension of disbelief, what if we had a different matrix, which I'll call the computational matrix, which is indexed by all the random coins, and at each entry, it holds the decision of the verifier where give, when given access to the proof, A, B. Okay? So this is the proof matrix here on the left and the computational matrix here on the right. Now, if we have this computational matrix, I want to show you why we're in really, really good shape. Okay? If, if we had. So, if we have this matrix, let's also assume that it's low rank, and let's also assume that we can compute its low rank decomposition based on the proof matrix decomposition. Well, if we assume all of these many, many non-trivial things, and indeed we are assuming many non-trivial things, right? Why is the computational matrix even low rank? And even if it is low rank, why is it efficiently computed, computable based on A and B? The answer will be rectangularity, and we'll get to this in a second. But except for this skeptical-looking fry here next to item number two, I want to say that we're in really good shape. Let's go through this. So if we had A prime and B prime, that their product is the computational matrix, well, we know we can count the number of ones in the product, but the, the number of ones in the computational matrix is exactly the acceptance probability, right? And so... Um, what the decision uh, procedure does, it looks at the acceptance probability. If it's high enough, it'll accept. Otherwise, it'll reject. This is indeed a good decision procedure. Why? Because if the input was in the language, there is some proof that convinces the verifier, right? Completeness. This proof was not rigid, so we can approximate it with a low rank matrix. This low rank matrix is accepted with high probability by tolerance, right? By smoothness. And therefore, the decision procedure will say yes. If the input was not in the language, then by soundness, no matter what low rank matrix we guess, no matter what matrix we guess at all, we'll always reject with high probability. So the decision procedure will reject as well. And why is the running time too good to be true? So similarly to before, we can guess the low rank decomposition, kind of guess it bit by bit and then verify it. This is where we use the NP Oracle. Computing A prime and B prime, completely unclear right now. We don't even know that they exist. So unclear, we'll get to this later. But of course, counting the number of ones, we know that we have some savings thanks to that very fast counting algorithm. So we managed to decide L in time too good to be true. It's a contradiction. Therefore, pi must have been rigid all along. And that's, that's it. Except, of course, now it's time for me to show you the heart of the matter. How can we compute the computational matrix? So back to PCPs. Okay. We know that we think of PCPs as proofs. So the picture roughly looks like this. Now, if we're going to be using pictures, let me make this simplifying assumption, which is that the verifier only issues two queries. And that the decision based on these two queries is a very simple one. It's the exclusive or of the answers of the proof oracle. Um, turns out that removing these assumptions, it's not really hard. I recommend uh, checking out the paper for more details about that. 
But now that we have this simplifying assumption, what does our picture look like instead of just many queries? We have exactly two. I'll conveniently refer to them as the blue query and the orange query. There is an indexing function for the blue query, say. It's called i. It takes a random coin sequence r and tells you which column and which row to query. And similarly, the orange query has an indexing function j, tells you which row and which column to query based on the randomness. And the decision procedure, it's very simple. It's just the exclusive or of the answers. So what is a rectangular PCP then? Let's go back here and take a look at the mapping i, okay? It looks at the randomness and based on the randomness, it outputs both the row and both the column of the query. In a rectangular PCP, you can partition the randomness into two disjoint parts such that the row of each query is determined only by the row part. It's the left part or the first half or however you want to call it. I'll call it the row part. Okay, it's this left die. This determines the row and the column part determines, the column part of the randomness determines the column of each query. Okay, so if you like symbols, this means that this function, this mapping i from randomness to queries or query locations, it knows which row to output based only on the left half of the randomness, on the row half of the randomness. It doesn't even need to look at the other half. It doesn't care what's written there. Okay, and this is it. This is the crucial part. Now let's see how we use it. Okay, this is a little symbol that, like, this is what I said in symbolic language. I put it in this yellow scroll, and later it'll be convenient when I claim that I proved something. So how do we get... A prime and B prime. Well, remember what we said many minutes ago when we were thinking about rigid matrices and compression, etc. So we look at a proof A, B. If it's low rank, then we know that the row part determines the row, the column part determines the column. And this means that to know the answer of the proof oracle A, B to a query based on a certain randomness, we know we need to take the dot product of this row of A and of this column of B, right? So this is this animation again. And similarly for the second query, of course. And the point is that we already know which row of A to take based only on the row part of the randomness. And this is it. So what is A prime then? Well, A prime will be a reordering of A's row, rows, sorry. So we'll start, we'll reorder it according to this indexing function. So we start from the first random coin sequence, which is the all zeros string, for example. And then we'll write the corresponding row of A under, of course, this mapping I. We'll move on to the second random coin sequence and then write this as the second row of a prime and we continue doing this reordering so on and so forth until we get to this permuted order of a okay it's it's a reordering of the rows of a and we'll call this reordering ai of course we won't neglect the orange query. So we'll do the very same thing for the orange query, reorder it according to its indexing function, J. And we'll concatenate both of these tall matrices to get this slightly wider, but still very narrow tall matrix. And we call this A prime. And of course we do the very same thing for the columns. So we reorder the columns of B according to the indexing functions to get B prime. And again, in symbolic language, this is very convenient because um, A prime times B prime will be A I B I, right? It's you take a row from here and you XOR it with a row from B I, and then you do the, sim the, the same thing for the orange parts, okay? And then you take the XOR of both of these together. That's, that's just what, matrix multiplication is. And you can already maybe start to see a similarity to what 
uh, what we had written as the verifier's decision. And if you don't, let me spell it out for you. So the claim is that for any possible randomness, right, the randomness indexes the rows of A prime and B prime. The corresponding entry in A prime times B prime is exactly the decision bit of the verifier, or it's exactly the decision, right, that the verifier makes on this random coin sequence. And the proof, and this is where those yellow scrolls come in handy, the proof is just by stringing together all of these observations we made. So spare me from saying all of these things out loud, but we've seen exactly why um, this is the case. So hopefully now I managed to convince you that computing the computational matrix can be done. And we saw that it was it was a very easy computation, assuming the indexing function is easy, which of course it is. Um, and this concludes the proof. So just to add a flavor of, you know, what is the main technical result, the main theorem in the paper is the existence of these like PCPs that are very, you know, close to state of the art in terms of how short and efficient they are. They're also smooth. They're also, well, they're not entirely rectangular, but they're close enough and they have some other interesting features. And please check out the paper if you want to know more. And that's it. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you for your time. Usually I'd stick around and answer questions, but, you know, I don't think it'll work as well in this medium. So if you do have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and see you next time.